Okay, welcome everybody. Give us a few minutes to make sure families are able to log on and join us and we'll get started momentarily. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. So hello everyone, my name is Mimi Mudd and I want to welcome you to the final webinar of our fall 2022 family webinar series. If you're a regular attendee of our webinars, you probably notice that I am not your usual host. I recently joined Student Transitions and Family Programs as an Assistant Director for Parent and Family Programs. And so I will be the host moving forward for this webinar series. You'll also be hearing from me in our Family Ties newsletter, and um, we're actually going to be moving to monthly Family Ties newsletters starting this January, so get excited for that. Tonight, I'm joined by my colleague, Evan Keel, who's the Assistant Director of Operations, and we're excited that you have chosen to join us tonight for our webinar about housing selection. I have some information to share with you all before we get started. So first, tonight's conversation is for parents and families of students in the classes of 2024, 2025, and 2026. If your student has just been admitted for next year, congratulations. I know this is an exciting time, but we do wanna let you know that this information is not applicable for first year students. Information for housing selection for incoming class of 2027 will be sent out later in the spring. Second, we want to make sure you know how to submit questions during this webinar. So you'll notice that we have given you the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature in Zoom. Our professional staff within Student Transitions and Family Programs is going to help field these questions. And to make sure that you all know how to use this feature, we're going to ask you now to please share the place from which you are watching this webinar in the Q&A feature. And then we'll share a few of those on air in a little bit. Third, we will be sharing a PowerPoint with you all. Um, this PowerPoint was created by our panelists during tonight's webinar, and you'll see it in the um, chat as well, a link to the PowerPoint. That's in case you prefer to download, download this PowerPoint and follow along on your own. Please use that link um, in order to do so. As a note, in the chat feature, we'll also be sharing links to other resources noted during the webinar and any types of email addresses that you might need. Fourth, this webinar is being recorded live. So next week, you'll be able to find it uploaded on our families.wustel.edu website. And in a moment, we'll hear from our panelists about housing selection. If something they say sparks a question, don't forget to submit your question in the Q&A feature. After the presentation, we'll then move into the question and answer portion of this evening. So before passing things along to Evan, I wanted to share some of the places people are joining us from tonight that we typed into the question and answer feature. So we have families tuning in from Nashville, Tennessee, Santa Rosa, California, and Boston, Massachusetts. So now, since I know you all wanna hear more about the housing selection, I'm going to turn it over to Evan. Hi, my name is Evan. I'm an Associate Director for Housing Operations in our Office of Residential Life. I use he, him pronouns, and I am very excited to be talking to you all tonight about our housing selection process. So our housing selection process has three steps. Uh, first, between February 1st and February 10th, students will need to submit a housing application. Then, they will select their roommates in the grouping phase between March 1st and March 10th. And then students will select their uh, housing assignment with their group between March 20th 
through 23rd and the 27th and 30th. Uh, and so students have to uh, complete each of those various phases uh, in order to have a complete application to be able to um, be able to participate in our process. So any student who is interested in living in residential life managed housing should apply uh, using the returning student housing application on our housing portal between February 1st and February 10th. And we say any student who is interested in, so uh, even if your student is considering living uh, in non-residential life managed housing, they still have an opportunity to go through this process without any penalty. As long as your student cancels uh, uh, their application before March 31st, there is no penalty, no fee, so a student can go through the entire process, um, see what their housing assignment may be, then have an opportunity uh, to cancel once they know that assignment or um, be able to accept that assignment because that's where they wanted to live. And again, they have to complete that application between February 1st and February 10th. So then when we talk about the grouping phase, uh, we ask students to form groups with their peers based on who they want to live with first, and then think about where they want to live second. So our institution prioritizes uh, roommates as opposed to location. And one of the ways that we help students find roommates uh, is through roommate mixers that we host in the spring semester. And so that is for, you know, a student who may say, I have some people that I may be interested in living with, but we need to find a couple more per people or maybe another person for our group to uh, be the number that we're hoping. And so we want to try to get out there and meet somebody. Um, and so everyone who attends those uh, roommate mixers in person is looking for other roommates for their group. And students are also able to search for roommates via the roommate finder after our application has closed during the grouping process. So um, students will answer a couple of questions as part of the, or a few questions as part of the application about their living habits and things like that. And students are able to search um, other students who have completed the application, what their answers are to those questions. If they find somebody they think they may fit with, reach out to them via email, um, uh, getting that information from the housing portal. Another part about grouping is that our group size, our housing stock vary from uh, singles or one bedrooms all the way up to eight person units. And so group sizes can vary from one to eight. Uh, and it is important to note that our housing stock is mostly comprised of um, four bedrooms when we're talking, four bedroom units when we're talking about our on-campus suites. So that would be the on-campus suites on the South 40, as well as uh, on the North side. And then when we talk about our off-campus apartments, those are generally three bedroom uh, units. And so typically students will choose to make groups of four if they're sophomores trying to get on-campus suites and groups of three if they're juniors and seniors trying to get into our off-campus apartment areas. And so those are, uh, we, you know, students aren't required to make those uh, sizes of groups. They can make groups again from one to eight because we have units of those sizes, but most of our housing stock, the, the way that it's most likely they're gonna get an assignment that uh, they're looking for is to make groups of uh, those sizes. And again, the grouping process happens between March 1st and March 10th. So when we talk about the select phase of the process, there are uh, two different uh, times where students will select housing. Um, uh, my apologies, could we go to the next slide? Or am I, sorry, I'm seeing it still on my group slide. Am I incorrect? Okay, Mimi, yeah, do you know? Yeah, or? I think um, it's frozen for one minute. We should be able to move okay. forward in a second. Yep. 
My apologies, everyone. I want to make sure that you're able to see the information as I'm uh, talking about it. And, and as I was saying, there are uh, two separate uh, phases to the selection process. So there is our on-campus suite selection, and there is our on and off-campus apartment selection. Our on-campus suite selection takes place between March 20th and March 23rd, and our on and off-campus apartment selection phase takes place between March 27th and March 30th. So when students form their groups, they will receive a time slot for one of those two processes based off of what they uh, filled out for. Um, and so for our on-campus suite selection process, those are uh, randomized time slots with priorities to groups that have sophomores. So sophomores have priority for on-campus uh, suites. Juniors and seniors typically do not enter this process. It's not that they're uh, not technically able to. Uh, it's the sophomores have priority for those on-campus suites, and, and typically there wouldn't be uh, enough on-campus suites for juniors and seniors. Uh, and there are spaces available both on the South 40 and the North side. About 60% of our sophomore class will live on the South 40, and about 40% will live on the North side and the north side is Village and La Pata. And so uh, we get a lot of questions about what are the differences between the South 40 suites and the north side suites. So both the north side and South 40 have dining facilities in those areas. They both have mail centers. They both have parking garages that are close to the halls available. Um, and they both have the same live-in staff fa and faculty support. Um, and the level of programming and attention to students is the same across both of these areas. The main differences are that the South 40 has both first years and sophomores living uh, on the South 40. The North side is only upperclassmen, so sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Um, in the South 40, their suites have common rooms that are in suite, whereas uh, on the North side, there are multiple common spaces on each floor. And then on uh, in the South 40, the bathroom ratio is a is a four to one bathroom ratio, whereas on the north side it's a two to one. Um, so inside the north side suites, there's two people assigned to each bathroom. On the South 40, that's four to one. Um, and in the case of our six person suites on the South 40, that is uh, six to one. Um, and then for our uh, the north side is also closer to academic buildings like. Olin uh, School of Business and the McKelvey School for Engineering. Uh, so those are just a few of the, the differences, but like I said, 60% of our sophomores will live on the South 40, 40% 40 will, will live on the North side, and um, sophomores have priority for on-campus suite selection. So then when we discuss on and off-campus apartment selection, this process has randomized time slots within class year that gives priority to seniors and then juniors and then sophomores. So um, that, you know, that means that seniors will have priority to select first. And those are, uh, ha this has spaces available both on the north side and off campus. That includes our Millbrook apartments in Village East and all of our off campus apartment areas. Uh, the next thing that I want to briefly touch on is administrative assignments. So administra administrative assignments means that our Res Life team assigns uh, students who have made a group to their units as opposed to that group selecting their own space during the selection phases that I just mentioned. And when we do that, we make every effort to uh, stay within that group's housing preferences and to make sure that that group stays together as roommates. Uh, the reason uh, an individual or a group may end up in may end up in our administrative assignments process is if, uh, for example, there were, let's say there were 10 
uh, uh, five person suites available and we had 15 groups of five. So five of those groups, we don't have space for uh, based off of the number, um, the group size that they chose. So they would enter our administrative assignments process and we would work, um, you know, when we have cancellations and other space to get that group of five into a space that works for them. Uh, and I want to be very clear that because students enter administrative assignments, it does not mean that we don't have enough uh, housing. We have enough housing to uh, be able to accommodate uh, all students who want to live with us. Uh, however, we might not have the exact unit size or we may not have the exact um, you know, building that they're looking for. And so that's when administrative assignments comes into play as well. Students who end up receiving a time slot and are able to go through the select phase, but don't necessarily see exactly what they wanted. So instead of uh, choosing to select, they chose to not select, they would move into our administrative assignments process as well. And we would work to try to get them into something that would meet their preferences. Uh, we recommend that students, if given a time slot, select um, a space, uh, but they're not required to. And then if they don't, they would move into that administrative assignments process. Another key piece about administrative assignments is that the cancellation policy around if you're in the administrative assignments process is different than if you are not. So if you're in the administrative assignments process and you have not received uh, an assignment from our office, you are able to cancel your contract without any penalty at any time. So even if it's later, um, you know, uh, past some of our, our deadlines where an, a student who had received an assignment would incur fees, if you haven't received an assignment, you're able to cancel without any penalty. However, once a group does receive their assignment, that group has a period of three business days where they're able to still cancel their contract with no penalty, um, but after those three business days, they would be held to our cancellation policy that's within the terms and conditions and published on our website. And to talk more about uh, our cancellation policy for those who do have assignments. So like I mentioned before, all students can cancel their housing uh, application through March 31st without any penalty. Uh, cancellations received on or after April 1st will be charged a $500 cancellation fee. And any cancellations received on or after June 15th will not be approved unless there is an approved withdrawal, deferral, or leave of absence from the university. Um, those individuals may still be subject to the $500 cancellation fee, um, but after June 15th, if you do not have one of those approved um, uh, that is approved items that are listed here on the slide, we would not um, approve the cancellation. Also want to take a moment to talk about our living learning communities. So LLCs are um, based around uh, particular themes, students who are wanting to uh, live together and learn and grow around a particular topic. So we have our Sakina LLC, our Hamsini LLC, and students are able to design their own uh, LLC as well. So if a student is attempting, or a student or a student group wants to design their own LLC, there's an application available on our website uh, and uh, on our LLC page on our website. If you Google LLC, still it'll be like the first link. Um, that deadline for that application is January 5th. And then uh, students who are interested in LLCs have to apply for that LLC outside of the normal housing application process. That deadline is February 5th, uh, and that application is also available on our website as well. However, if a student is interested in an LLC, they still have to fill out a housing application. Um, so they may not necessarily go through the grouping process or the selection process because the LLCs are in particular areas of our housing stock, um, but they still have to fill out an application and be approved to be a part of that LLC. LLCs have faculty advisors. Um, they have uh, programming funds particular for their community. 
And again, they're able to live with uh, people who have similar interests that may or may not be surrounded or surround an academic uh, focus or maybe just personal interests of those students. And I also want to talk a little bit about uh, chapter facility housing. So students who are offered a bid and accept a bid from a fraternity should communicate with their chapter leadership about house capacity uh, while the housing process is ongoing. Students who are interested in chapter facility housing still need to complete a housing application in order to be eligible. And then their uh, chapter leadership would send us uh, the list of students who um, have expressed interest in living in the uh, chapter facility. In addition, uh, we have gender inclusive housing. And so we do uh, gender inclusive housing refers to individual rooms or suites where the gender of roommates is not a limiting factor for the assignments process. So for example, we typically uh, put individuals of the same gender together, um, but gender inclusive assignments accommodates individuals of any gender identity and um, includes individuals who are open to living with any gender identity as well. Uh, one last thing that I will uh, speak about that is not is not on a slide uh, is if a student uh, has a current housing accommodation, so they live with us currently and they have a current housing accommodation through disability resources, they should follow up with disability resources, letting them know that they that they intend to apply for housing again for the next academic year. Uh, and then disability resources may or may not ask for any additional documentation. Um, and once that is approved through their office, they'll let us know and we'll be sure um, to meet that accommodation again. It is important to do that as soon as you possibly can. Once we go through the selection phase um, and students have assignments, we're not, we, we can't kick other students out in order to meet a housing accommodation. So it's important that uh, we're able to have your housing accommodation in and that you still complete a housing application, still go through the grouping process. Um, and then we would just make sure that we um, assign you to a uh, housing option that meets your accommodation prior to every, everyone else going in and selecting. Um, if you believe you may need a housing accommodation and don't have one currently, you need to follow up with our Disability Resources Office in order to provide the documentation needed to get that approved. And again, do that as soon as possible. Um, and so other than that, that is all that I had to share with you all tonight and looking forward to answering some of your questions. Great, thank you so much, Evan, for all of that information. I'll go ahead and stop the screen share. Um, so just a reminder for everybody to be submitting questions in the Q&A feature. I'm already seeing some come through, which is great. Um, I do have a question that I think some families might already be wondering. It's the first question to kind of kick off this evening. So what resources, if any, does the university provide regarding non-WashU off-campus housing? Yes, and so um, our neighborhood care team uh, works with students who live off-campus in non-residential life housing. Uh, and you can find that information on the website. I also lead that team as well. Um, one of the easiest resources to look at um, for off-campus housing that's not affiliated with residential life is the Apartment Referral Services website. Um, should be uh, ars.wustel.edu. Um, I'd have to triple check that, but um, the Apartment Referral Services website is run by the Office of Real Estate uh, in, in WashU, and they manage that website. They, um, if they receive a number of complaints from uh, students about a particular landlord, they take their postings off of that website. Um, and so uh, it is a good way for students to look for off-campus housing. There's also another roommate finder tool or a, a sublease finding tool or posting a sublease uh, on that website as well. And so any student who is considering um, looking at off-campus non-residential life housing should look at the Apartment Referral Services website as well. 
Great, thank you, Evan. Okay, so we are going to move into the remainder of our question answer portion of this webinar. So the next question for you, we have a few questions about upperclassmen choosing to live in residential life housing. Um, so the first question, can juniors and seniors live in Village East or is it exclusive to sophomores? Um, Village East and Millbrook are apartments. So those are on-campus apartments. They're part of our on and off-campus apart, uh, apartment selection process, which gives priority uh, to those who are seniors and then juniors and then sophomores. So um, it is possible that juniors and seniors would be living in Village East and they would have the um, highest level of priority to do so. So the next question is, where do most upperclassmen students who choose to live on campus live, if there is a general place? So um, if it is about junior seniors living on campus, those options are Millbrook and Village East. If we're talking about residential life managed housing as a whole, um, upperclassmen typically live in our off-campus apartment area. So the Lofts, Greenway, 520 Kingsland, our Washington apartments, and our Rosedale Court apartments. I know you spoke a little bit about this in your presentation, but our next question is about students who already have a roommate or two, but they're looking to kind of complete that set for where they're hoping to live. What recommendations do you have for them to find somebody to live with? Yes, I would highly recommend that they attend our roommate mixers. The schedule will be coming out um, for that uh, before the start of next semester, and that'll be available on our website. We'll be communicating that, having uh, advertising and flyers up in the halls, as well as as part of our newsletters um, that we send out um, biweekly to the students who live in the halls as well, so that they're going to be very aware of that schedule. But attending the roommate mixers and using the um, housing portal during the grouping phase to find individuals who answer lifestyle questions similar to them is a great way to find uh, potential roommates. I would recommend that you know anybody who is going to be entering a roommate relationship with somebody they may not be very familiar with, make sure you take time to talk about the difficult questions about living with one another and setting expectations about um, not only, you know, what are maybe maybe some of the uh, lifestyle expectations as part of uh, living in that group together, but also how you all are going to handle conflict uh, and set an agreement about how that will be done prior to um, solidifying your group. And then a follow up to that, what should a student do if they're unable to form a group um, for housing with other students? Yeah, so um, we have a number of students who make a group of one. Uh, and so then we work to place those students uh, together based off of um, lifestyle, the lifestyle questions that they answered, as well as uh, where they were hoping to live. And, and so we have plenty of students who go through the process without a roommate in mind. There's actually a great article uh, in Stud Life Housing Guide regarding a student who went through the administrative assignments process because they didn't have a roommate that they wanted to select all four years and uh, what their experience was with that. So I would encourage anyone who's maybe uh, wondering what that process looks like, looking at uh, from a student perspective. Again, if there's a great article in stu the Student Life, Stud Life Housing Guide uh, about what that looks like. Thank you. So our next question is about what is provided in the apartments. So a parent or family member asked if the apartments are fully furnished with kitchens, do they have plates, cutlery, pots, pans, et cetera? So all of our residential uh, life managed housing comes fully furnished. Uh, and in the apartments in particular, they have a fridge, a stove, uh, a full-size fridge, a full-size stove, uh, as well. We do not uh, provide cutlery, pots, pans, you know, items to cook with. It is the furniture and the appliances are provided. All the other pieces to go along with that, students would need to bring themselves. So 
So this is for students who are currently studying abroad. When will they be finding out about housing for the spring semester? So for students who have already completed the uh, spring uh, 2023 housing application, uh, they will at the latest find out by January 1st. If they have not received an assignment by January 1st, they should call us when our office opens after the holiday on uh, January 3rd. We have our office hours are 8.30 to 5, and we'll work with them to uh, uh, identify their assignment because everyone will be assigned by uh, who's completed a spring 2023 housing application at this point. Um, they should have their assignment at that point in time. Great. Our next question is generally about sophomores. So what percentage of sophomores choose to live on campus? Yeah, we see a retention rate of about 95%. Um, so about 95% of the current first year class, uh, typically, you know, from our data from many, many years, choose to live with us again. And then generally, another percentage question we got was what percentage of rising juniors tend to end up living, they specified, on campus? Yeah, and that really varies year to year. Um, it, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how many of uh, particular group sizes there are. The Millbrook Apartments have a large number of uh, group sizes uh, for their units. From, they have four, five, six, seven, and eight person units, depending on what uh, juniors and seniors uh, put together as their group numbers, really depends, and what sophomores choose to do, really depends. So there's not a clear cut answer I can give. Um, it varies widely from year to year. Um, as far as uh, what juniors uh, would end up living in the apartment. Sorry, I ended up going on a tangent uh, thinking about sophomores. So, um, you know, in our current on and off campus selection process, the, the seniors theoretically could fill all of Millbrook and all of Village East, meaning that what would be remaining would be the three, uh, the three bedroom apartments off campus for uh, the juniors, but seniors could have uh, a huge desire to be living off campus. And so it really has varied very much year to year. Um, and there's not a great answer. What I would say is that most of our apartment housing stock is going to be uh, those three bedroom units. And those are our off campus apartments. That's um, the most likely way to uh, ensure that you have uh, an apartment secured that's managed by residential life. Um, but Village East is all four person units and Millbrook has four, five, six, seven and eight person units. So if someone was looking to live on, on campus, they'd want to make a, a group in one of those sizes. Great, thanks. So a family member shared that their son is going to be a junior and they're going to be living with several friends. They're hoping you could share about some of the advantages and disadvantages of living in an off-campus housing that's university owned versus living in an off-campus housing that is private apartment, not university owned. The biggest one is if anyone, I mean, the one that jumps out to me is if anyone in that group of juniors is intending to go abroad, it, it is extremely advantageous to live with residential life because you don't have to worry about subleases. You don't have to worry about uh, talking to your private landlord about canceling. Um, private landlords typically lock you in full of, for a full year, and there is no way you can get out of that lease unless the landlord's not doing what they're supposed to do. When you live with uh, residential life, if a student's going abroad, you submit a cancellation request, and there's no issue. We let the student out, and the rest of the group is not penalized. In an off-campus apartment with the landlord, they typically sign group leases. Uh, and so that means everyone who signs that lease is equally responsible for the full cost of the rent. So if one person goes abroad, they're unable to find a subleaser. Now the three people who are left have to pick up that tab. In residential life, we do individual contracts. And so you are never on the hook for someone else's bed space. Uh, that, that's 
easily one of the biggest advantages. The second advantage I would say about uh, living in residential life housing is um, we operate, uh, how should I say, to the standard uh, of WashU. An off an off campus landlord may not have the same uh, policies and procedures when it comes to maintenance, security, um, uh, and just when an issue comes up, maybe responsiveness. Uh, and so th those are some of the things that uh, we we you know have me working with students who live both in non-residential life managed housing and residential life managed housing. Typically, uh, the biggest advantage is that when you live in WashU housing, we have a, a much higher standard of care for our students. Your landlord, to be frank, doesn't really care about you. They care about your money. And when you live with residential life, we care about you as a student, your academic well-being, the resources that you're going to have, your social well-being. And so those are things that we're focusing on because we're not trying to make a buck. So continuing on the same train about university owned off campus apartments, we're receiving a few questions about that. So the first question about university owned off campus apartments is where are they located? Yep, so we have some on University Drive, which is uh, across the street from the north side. So Forest, on Forest Park Parkway on the south side is the north side on uh, on the north side of Forest Park Parkway would be where New Dr U Drive is. Um, on Kingsland and between Kingsland and Melville and Washington, that's where we have green the Greenway Apartments. That's where we have um, the 520 Kingsland Building, where we have our Washington Avenue Apartments. And then on Del Mar uh, Boulevard is where the lofts are. And within the Skinker de Bolivar uh, neighborhood, uh, that is where Rosedale is situated. All of them are within walking distance of the institution. Um, you know, not saying it's a five minute walk, but they're easily within walking distance. And all of those, uh, all of ours have shuttle stops that come right up to the door of each of those buildings. Uh, and the shuttles run on, you know, a 20 minute schedule. Um, and if you know there's ever been any issues with uh, the shuttles, we work with our partners over at Parking Transportation to get that corrected very quickly. Um, and so, um, you know, students who live off campus have a lot of transportation uh, options for getting to and from campus, uh, just like you would if you were living on. And um, we offer our campus to home shuttle, so students who are on campus late can take a shuttle to uh, those locations um, all the way up until 4 a.m. Somewhere between 2 and 4 a.m. I'd have to look at our parking and transportation website to, to be 100% sure, but we have shuttles that go really late um, and they start very early at 7 a.m. So there should be no issue with the student getting to and from an off-campus uh, location, regardless of where it's located. Is WPD providing security support to these apartments? Yep. And so uh, on one of the major pathways uh, or the major pathways from campus to these off-campus apartments, um, we have our uh, Neighborhood Safety Ambassador Program. And so uh, WPD works with one of our security partners to have uh, walking guards on those paths pass from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. daily. Uh, and then uh, WPD also has their neighborhood patrol. So they're out in the neighborhoods patrolling regularly um, in vehicles and on bikes. Uh, and that is separate. That's a separate unit from our on-campus patrols. So there is WPD officers dedicated specifically to being out in the neighborhoods, uh, working with um, security around our buildings in the off-campus areas. Great. And then what about housekeeping and maintenance services? Are those available for these apartments as well? So um, one of the one of the things that is different about living in an apartment than living than living in our suites for residential life is that you're responsible for your own cleaning. 
So if you remember your student talking about the housekeeping service they get in the South 40 or in the suites on the north side, housekeepers will come in and clean their bathrooms on a regular schedule. Um, in, in, uh, in the apartments, students are responsible for cleaning their units, including their bathrooms. And maintenance is provided to all of our buildings, um, just like it would uh, regard, regardless of where you're living. And so students would follow the same method of filling out a maintenance request form. Um, and then that gets sent to our uh, maintenance staff. And then they you know, go repair the issue or get a contractor out who can repair the issue if they're unable to do so. Great. And then is parking available at these off-campus university-owned apartments? Yes. And so uh, the lofts has a parking garage um, that is, um, you are offered a pass for the lofts garage as part of living in the lofts. For Greenway and you drive there, uh, for Greenway, there's a parking lot at the building that Greenway residents are able to use. Um, it's not a parking garage, but it's a part, you know, a, a parking lot. And then on U Drive, there are specific uh, parking spaces for those uh, buildings right in front of and behind those buildings. Um, for Rosedale, it is public parking on the street. There is no parking lot. Um, and then the uh, wa the Washington Avenue apartments. Uh, and 520 Kingsland both have uh, parking lots associated with those buildings as well, as well as street parking, you can do either. Great, a few more questions about our off-campus university owned apartments, um, just confirming that they are furnished as well. And then um, are they full academic year length like leases? So for our off-campus residential life managed, uh, uh, Universe, like our residential life managed apartments that are off campus, they're fully furnished. Uh, they have all the furniture and appliances similar to what I was talking about before. We don't provide, you know, pots and pans or other things like that. Um, and then the leases are for the academic year. So from August until May, they are not 12 months. And then last one about those specific off-campus res life run apartments, are sophomores able to live in those? Sophomores are able to live in those. Uh, typically, we find that our seniors uh, and juniors are living in those uh, off-campus apartments. Uh, however, and I, as I explained um, in the presentation, our on and off-campus apartment selection process gives uh, has randomized time slots within class year so seniors get the highest priority then juniors and then sophomores as part of that process so we typically see that uh sophomores uh, the vast majority of sophomores uh go through the on-campus suite selection process and are successful in doing that there are sophomores that choose to go through the on and off campus uh, apartments selection process um, but they have the lowest priority. Thank you for that. Okay, so moving into a little more general questions, how and when will students find out about their housing assignment for next year? Yes, and so if they're if we're talking about their housing assignment for the 2023-2024 uh, academic year, they would select their housing assignment during the selection phase. So between March 20th and March 23rd for our uh, on-campus suite selection uh, part of the process. And then for our on and off-campus apartment selection process, it's March 27th through March 30th. So when they select, they would find out. For individuals going through the administrative assignments process, that process can go into the summer. Um, individuals you know cancel their housing for various reasons and as that happens uh, we move people from the administrative assignments process into uh, housing options that are going to fit their preferences great and then when can um, or where can people see floor plans for various housing accommodations and find other like general information about what 
each option may include. Yep, so that should be available on our website. Uh, so if you go to the Residential Life website, there um, are a number of mm, community, excuse me, uh, community pages. So they'll be an Apartments North community page, Apartments South community page, North Side communities, and South Forty communities. Um, and you'll be able to see the um, floor plans uh, of what unit types are available in those spaces. Um, and if you do have any, you know, specific questions um, regarding what you're seeing on the website, you can always uh, email reslife at wustel.edu regarding those questions. We also have our virtual tours page. Um, and so if you search, you know, reslife virtual tours wash you into Google, you'll see that and you'll be able to see uh, different buildings in our housing stock and be able to go through and actually do a 360 virtual tour of the spaces. Great. So this is a question specific to Beyond Boundaries residence halls. So do first year students living in the designated Beyond Boundaries residence hall have priority to live in that space as sophomores? I am not uh, particularly familiar with the Beyond Boundaries program. So that is something that I'd wanna be able to, uh, you know, be able to talk with the individual who submitted that question. If, if you all be able to pull that for me so that I can reach out to them. Um, you know, sometime in the next uh, uh, next couple of days, that would be great. Um, but typically, um, individuals uh, as part of our on-campus suite selection process, when it's their time to select from their time slot, they'll see all the options that are available for their group size and then be able to select based off of that. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, other you know, special cases outside of that. Okay, are there any specific housing options you suggest for students planning to study abroad for either the fall or spring semester um, next year specifically or any year? Yep, so if you're uh, studying abroad in the spring, go through the housing selection process like you normally would you know, try to get the spaces that you'd want to live in. And then when it's time to go abroad in the spring, you submit your cancellation form and we let you out and you go abroad. No problem. If you're abroad in the fall and then you're returning in the spring, you will be limited. Your options will be limited to what's available. Um, and so that happens based off of, um, you know, students that go abroad, students that may cancel or take a leave of absence during the year. Um, and typically, those are uh, those spaces available um, for individuals who are returning from uh, a fall semester abroad are on our north side and in our off-campus apartments. So do they need to notify Res Life of their plans to go abroad prior to the cancellation, or do they just need to go through that process? So for students who are studying abroad in the spring semester, uh, we ask uh, usually early November, but before November 15th, that they submit a cancellation indicating that they intend to go abroad. And then our office approves it, tell them that they need to move out at the end of the fall semester. And then we cancel their uh, housing contract for the spring. But when you sign up and you go through the housing uh, selection process, um, for the upcoming academic year. Your contract is for both semesters. Um, and then that's why we have to do that cancellation part to make sure we have all of our uh, documentation uh, correct. For those who are studying abroad in the fall, they would not take part in the returning student housing selection process. Um, they would wait until uh, we open our spring 20, or our spring application uh, which typically happens around November. Great. Okay, what housing options are available for students staying in St. Louis over the summer for an internship or work or anything like that? Yep, and so our summer conferences uh, and our, our summer programs and conference services office handles all summer, 
uh, on campus or you know residential life managed housing um, summer term uh, housing needs. So our, my office does not does not manage that. Um, but for students who are wanting to stay in uh, WashU owned and managed housing, they would work with our summer conferences and program service office once they open the summer application. And students could still use the apartment referral services website to find subleases uh, for the summer if they're looking to, to stay for maybe you know an eight week or 12 week internship. Great. So we have a family member asking if you could explain the difference between modern and traditional housing. Yep. So for uh, our traditional buildings, um, we we talk about traditional and modern in reference to South 40 spaces and specifically. Um, they the the biggest difference between modern and traditional is traditional buildings do not have elevators. Modern buildings do. Um, if you're talking about traditional buildings and you're not talking about traditional suite buildings. So we have traditional buildings and traditional suite buildings, uh, suite style buildings. Traditional buildings have a common um, uh, a, a common communal bathroom uh, for uh, the typical two genders on each floor. Um, if you're in a traditional suite, you would have a bathroom in your suite, just like all the other suites do. Um, and so then the biggest difference between a modern suite and a traditional suite is that there's no elevator in the building. All of the our buildings have, you know, uh, full kitchens in them. All of our communities uh, have access to the same resources and amenities on the South 40, except for that elevator. Great, thank you. Okay, we got a question specific to living in fraternity housing. So the fraternity houses that are options for some of the IFC fraternities. How does that impact their housing application? Um, and another specific question, if a student's living in a fraternity house, but then decides they would like to move back to other university housing, are they able to do so? So I'll start with the first question. If someone is going through uh, or is considering chapter facility housing, they still have to fill out a housing application and they need to talk to their chapter leadership about their desire to live in uh, the chapter facility. Uh, the chapter facility leadership then notifies our office of who um, you know, intends to, they intend to have in the chapter facility we notify the students that we've received their name from chapter leadership. Uh, they don't. They then uh, don't need to go through any other part of the process. They submitted their application. They've gotten notification that they're part of the chapter facility uh, group. If a student uh, has, if a student has uh, made their way onto the list of individuals uh, that are going to be in the chapter facility and that's not something they want to do, they should notify both our office and the uh, their chapter immediately uh, so that we can make sure that that gets corrected. However, after the grouping phase ends, there really isn't an opportunity for someone to pull out of the chapter facility process. Um, the best way is you you really have to decide up front if you want to go through the be in the chapter uh, facility or if you want to go through the general housing process you can't kind of have a a foot in both processes if that makes sense and then our next question is about a student who's currently living in non res life off campus housing are they able to move back into res life housing next academic year so uh, students who are not currently living with us do not qualify for eligibility for the returning student uh, selection process. However, uh, after we've gone through our process, uh, students are able to add their name to the, uh, the housing wait list uh, who are off campus. And then we will, uh, make sure that or we will do our best to get them uh, an 
residential life space if we have the availability. And so our first commitment is to the students who have continued to, um, to, li to live in residential life housing. And then after that, we, we do our best to house uh, other individuals who are looking to move back on back into residential life housing from our non-residential life areas. Great. And then our second to last question for the evening. So if a student does not receive their first choice of housing this year, how does that impact, does that impact their like priority in housing for next year? So students select, as part of the selection process, you and your group or your group leader will go in and see everything that's available for your group size. You can choose at that time to make a choice or to not choose, uh, uh, to, to select the housing you're hoping to get. Um, if you're wanting, let's say a particular building, let's say you really wanted Greenway, you made a group of three, Greenway wasn't available, but there still might be three bedrooms available in the lofts. If you're willing to take that with your group, you select that and you select your room and you're good to go. If you said, no, I really wanted to be in Greenway, you then don't select anything and you'll move to the administrative assignments process. And if given the opportunity, um, you know, we may offer you another uh, three bedroom apartment, uh, maybe in Greenway, could also be in your second or third choice area. Um, but be, if you didn't get your first choice, you would not be given a higher priority or a different level of priority in any uh, subsequent process. Great, thank you, Evan. So our last question tonight is just where is um, a good place for parents and families to go to be best supported when navigating housing selection or to best support their students when navigating housing selection? Yeah, so for parents, um, our website is gonna have all of the detailed information. So a lot of what I shared in my presentation is very much the general pieces of information. I'm working on getting all of our detailed new information published on the website, and that should all be done by January 1st. Um, and so if your student is having a question, you're like, I'm not, you know, I feel like there might have been an answer for that. Or I remember Evan maybe saying something about that during the webinar. You can always, one, go back and revisit this webinar. Um, but two, you'll be able to look at our website and see every detailed uh, piece of information that we can provide. And then if you're not able to find that when supporting your student or your student's a little anxious um, about the process as a whole, um, you can let them know, one, we have enough housing to house everyone who wants to live with us. So they can be assured of that. May not necessarily be their first choice, but that's why we really encourage students to group with people they want to live with first. Because regardless of where you end up living, you're going to have a good time if you're with the people that you want to live with. Um, and if for some reason you're not sure how to help your student, you can always reach out to us or uh, have the student reach out to our office with those questions uh, at reslife, uh, reslife at wustel.edu. Um, and that is that. I oversee the team that manages, you know, our front desk and our emails and our phone calls. And so uh, they have all been, you know, made aware of all of our housing selection details and they're able to help students just as much as I would be able to. Evan, thank you again. Families, we hope you learned valuable information this evening. We know we were not able to get to all of our questions that were submitted tonight. Please reach out to ResLife through that email Evan just shared, reslife at wustel.edu, and they will be happy to answer your questions. As a reminder, this webinar recording will be shared at families.wustel.edu next week. Stay tuned for more information about our spring 2023 family webinar series next semester. You can also find that information at families.wustel.edu next week. We hope you all have a good night.